privilege for me to share this pulpit, uh, this time with uh, the pastor of this church, Hunter. So, just to let you know, this is not my iPad, it's my wife's iPad, I'm learning it. <laughs> it's not my own. So, and I'm asking her for her help here, so uh, something going on. So, anyway, my name is Daniel Auguste. I am from many diff several different churches. I have been doing many different things for my denomination, the American Baptist Churches. I'm a pastor, a church planter, and I'm working on the different uh, projects as we speak. So, I'm happy to be here and share the word with you. So, I can't say anything. Good. Good news. Good. So, you are, you are going to turn your Bible in, uh, with me in Psalm 37. We'll be reading the first seven verses, or the first six verses. Do not fret because of evil men, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord and be will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn the justice of your cause like the noon day soon. This is the word of the Lord. In trying to understand what David is telling us in this passage, we have to find out what the exegetical idea of the text is. In order for me or for any uh, preacher or Bible reader to understand what God wants us to know from reading a passage is to know the main idea of the text. Here, the main idea of the passage we just read is do not fret or don't worry because of those who are evil, wicked, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like grass, they will soon be withered like the green plants, they will soon die away. But instead, trust in the Lord and do good. This is the main message of the scripture we just read. My homiletical idea is, after reading, the passage, I can tell you, church, relax. Relax. Be happy. God has your back. Relax. Be happy. God has your back. All God asks you to do is to trust in him. And don't worry. He will take care of the rest. My purpose this morning 
as you are hearing this sermon, I want you, my listeners, to know that in all circumstances, at all times, we can trust God because he is in control. All we need to do when we worry is to relax, be happy, and know that God has your back. My sermon introduction might seem a little pointed, but if you have a TV or a radio set, or the internet, or a Twitter, or a Facebook, or Instagram, or LinkedIn account, or on, your own, or on a cell phone, you'll find that I am not going to be the first source of criticism about how the world's events are unfolding in a not so encouraging way. We live in a very, very scary world, in a very troubled world. We are experiencing very uncertain times where the social disparity is rampant. Racial injustices are at an all-time high. Xenophobic behavior has been seen advertised on social media by powerful people. Police brutality has caused many innocent lives. Baseless and violent riotings across our land are responsible for much destruction of all kinds. And most of them had gone unpunished. Racial division, intolerance, and economic inequality are deepening. Plus, we are dealing with a deadly pandemic which costs more than 230 lives and over 9 million are infected. We live in a world where the rich is getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. According to Business Insider, while 40 million Americans file for unemployment during the pandemic, but billionaires saw net worth increase by half a trillion dollars. The weak are getting more weak, and the innocents are getting quashed. The passage, despite all that, urges us not to worry because of the weak prosperity success, or envy those who do wrong. God forbids us to worry, to fret at the prosperity of the weak in the sinful ways. The passage seems to equate evil to rich. The, ev the weak to the rich. Although in reality, you and I, we all know that people can be successful without being wicked. God is very upfront with us and warns us against the temptation of being angry when we live next to a rich neighbor. We cannot and should not be quick or apt to label our friends or neighbors or colleagues or co-workers, for that matter, weak. Because we see this text is speaking about the wicked who happen to be rich rather than the rich per se. We have to make a distinction between a wicked from a rich because the two are not the same. Some people work very, very hard to be successful. They spent many, many years going to school to educate themselves. 
many, many hours working almost nonstop, sometimes far away from the loved ones, family members, friends, and the hobbies that they, that they love. In the Hebraic sense, do not fret, do not worry means do not worry. Do not be furious or burn or become angry or be kindled or be angry with, in that matter, with the wicked or get vexed or afflicted. Because anger or wrath leads to evil. That's why Psalm 37, verse 8, refrains us from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. Do not worry. Because when we do, it leads only to evil. Sometimes, in this very chapter, we see the success of the evildoers are due to schemes. This is one of the reasons we are reminded, exhorted, not to worry or be furious or get vexed about their wealth. He says again three times, at least, in the same chapter. He said in chapter 8, verse 30, chapter verse 8, in the, chap in the same chapter, refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, do not worry. It leads only to evil. Verse 9, do not fret, meaning do not worry. When people succeed in their ways, what they carry out, the wicked schemes. So that means we are reminded, we are exhorted, we are encouraged to stay away from, bad be from those bad behaviors. When we look within, we find ourselves tempted to worry. To be furious or burn or become angry or vex or be envious of the scandals and burdens of this earth. We are quick to blame God or a friend for the success or God for not giving us enough. We are quick to call God unkind to the world or unkind to us or to his church in allowing such men to live and prosper and prevail as they do. We are quick to pressure ourselves with affliction and anger and sometimes we lose sleep over that. We are quick to envy them and sometimes even curse them for their massive wealth and perhaps by unlawful means. According to James, the half brother of Jesus, there are ethical problems when Christians show signs of anger, envy, and jealousy toward the evil and those who do wrong. James forbids against harboring bitter envy and selfish ambition in our hearts and take the liberty to boast about it or deny it. 
James says in James 3 verse 14, But if you harbor bitter and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. He will say, he will say two very important words. If you harbor bitter envy or selfish ambition, number one, do not boast. Meaning, do not be arrogant about it. Don't think it's a cool thing to do. If your neighbor happens to be successful or a member in your family or your wife or your husband or your co-worker or your colleague or your pastor or your church member or anyone, if they happen to be successful, to succeed at every level of the career, of everything that they do, rejoice, be happy, celebrate that. I go by that kind of principle. When people get something, I think I, can, I am next. When people are su succeed in something, I think I can succeed too. This is reassuring. This is a very good thing when we live in a community where people possess stuff, materials. We know if we work hard, we can have that too. Do not worry. Don't be furious. Don't be fret. Don't envy those wicked people who possess so much. There are other reasons James sees why bitter envy and selfish ambition are on Christian. Hear what he said. James said in James 3.15, they are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Sometimes we say we wish we had this. We wish we had that. What our friends have. But sometimes you don't know what they do to get what they get. James 3.15 says, such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. So if we envy our friends, our community, the rich, the 1% who possesses the 99% versus the 99% who possesses 1%, if you don't know how they got it, whether by way of unlawful or schemes, not only we have to celebrate that, we cannot worry about it, we cannot be furious about it, we cannot be angry about it, because we are Christian and we are reminded to be relaxed, be happy, God has your back. God will take care of his church. The church is forbidden to become a place where the sins are taking a hold. And the reasons he gives is that you will feel, you will find this other conduct at an every evil practice. That's what the passage and God is trying to prevent from happening. When we display envy and jealousy, we may create a place of disorder and evil practice, conduct, behavior. James says in James 3.16, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find this other and every evil practice. So we must refrain from envy 
bitter envy, and selfish ambition. And also John, in John 1, 14, verses 1 to 3, John 14, verses 1 to 3, he said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My father's house has many wombs. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And I go and prepare a place for you. I will come back and take you with me that you also may be where I am. Do not let your heart be troubled by what you see, by what you hear, by what you have or don't have, by, by what you possess or not. Relax. Be happy. God has your back. What causes why are they forbidden in the first place? James 4 verse 1. En bitter envy and selfish ambition and jealousy that leads to fights in the church and quarrels among you. He says in James 4, 1, what causes fights and quarrels among you, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? And those desires that battle within us are the envy, be the envy, jealousy, and selfish ambition. The second reason God forbids us to worry at the wicked prosperity in the sinful ways has nothing to do with Christian ethics, but with the, the disadvantage of being rich in evil ways. What are the disadvantages? The disadvantage of being successful in sinful ways, number one, everything you make won't be around for too long. They won't be around for too long. Psalm 37 verse 2 says, For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. And in the, in, in the same passage, in the same chapter, they say the rich who possess wealth in evil ways, they will be broke. When we read down in the text. They will be broke. I don't understand that when I read it. The, the, there are people who have substantial amount of money. We know that cannot happen. That will never happen, in fact. But, and yet, the chapter, in, in, chapters, in, in the chapter 37, it says, there will be broke. Jeff Bezos cannot be broke. They cannot be broke. Even though they could live 10,000 years, they can be broke. Even the mark, market crashes every year, they cannot be broke. Warren Buffett, Michael Bloomberg, the Microsoft guy, they can't be broke. But what they can lose is the soul. They can have a deficit of soul. A spiritual brokenness. They can be broke spiritually. I read, I'm not saying Jeff Bezos is a wicked person. I'm not saying that. I am not saying that, please. But let me say this. I read, during the pandemic, for instance, What Amazon makes in a month is what they used to make 
in six months prior to the pandemic. What they make in a month is what they made in six months prior to the pandemic. So that means you cannot say those people will be woke, even though the Bible says they will be woke. But I was trying to understand what does the Bible mean by those kind of people can be woke. I understand maybe spiritually speaking, they can be woke. The disadvantage of being successful in, in sinf sinful ways is that everything you make will not be around too long. Chapter 37, verse 2. Everything on this earth will pass away. Matthew 24, verse 35 says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. That's why we understand if you have everything that you have, if you don't have Christ, you have nothing. You have nothing. We church are encouraged to know that though sometimes we walk, though sometimes we don't have everything that we need, we sometimes only get enough to get by. We cannot really do what we need to do. What we normal people, but sometimes we say, what normal people do, we don't have enough to do them. But we normal. And yet we are encouraged. Do not worry about those things. Because the most important thing is to be saved. Is to know Jesus. Is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because we, when we have a relationship with Christ, not only we cannot be broke spiritually on this earth, but we also have a mansion that is being prepared for us in heaven. And this is where we will be. This is where we spend our eternity. Because everything will pass. Only the word of God will never pass. The eternal consequences of spiritual poverty. The prosperity will disappear like the wind. See in Psalm 1, verses 4 and 5, it says, Not so the wicked. They are like chaff, and the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. This is the disadvantage of being so successful in sinful ways. They will not stand the judgment of God. The judgments of God will sooner cut them down. In other passages, it says, we'll cut them off. It will remove everything that they have. The triumphing is short. But the weeping and wailing will be everlasting. The third reason, if I may, oh. church, if the church doesn't have, it's not God's fault. It's our own fault when poverty exists among us. Because God says in Haggai 2, verse 8, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. But why the church doesn't have enough and the evil does not, does, who do not ask God have plenty? Why don't we have enough and the evil, they don't ask God and they have plenty? There are three reasons we don't have when we need. Number one, because we do not ask. Number two, or we ask with wrong motives. Thirdly, we ask with self-service motives for our own pleasures. We don't ask of 
that will help us to serve God. James 4 verse 2, D says, you do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. You don't ask. You don't ask because you don't ask or because you ask with wrong motives or because you ask for yourself. Here's how you pray and ask. God what you need. One, do not be angry or afflicted or vexed or furious or frustrated. Don't worry when you pray. Lean on God. Leave it to God. Trust in the Lord. Just submit your prayer. Just submit yourself to him. Don't complain when you pray God for something. Don't say my neighbor has plenty. Nice car. Nice house. Michael Jordan has a yacht that costs $80 million. I don't know what he's going to do with it. $80 million. And I could go off and on because I read them. But what you need to do when you ask, in conclusion, commit your way to the Lord and you shall receive what you need. Commit your way. Meaning, roll over your frustration, your anger. Roll them over to God. Take them off your, take them off your back and put them on God's back. Commit your way to the Lord. Walk in the, in the Lord's way. And then ask, and it shall be given to you. Second, when you pray, rejoice always in the Lord when you pray. Be reasonable in, to everyone, especially your neighbor. First of all, when you pray, do not worry. Don't get vexed. Don't be frustrated about anybody, anything. And second, rejoice. Be happy. Relax. God will take care of you. Do not be anxious about anything. All you need to do in every need, present your prayer and supplication with thanksgiving and let your requests be known to God. Just let them be known to God. And then lastly, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul wrote to the Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord. Always, again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. My brothers and sisters, we are encouraged I will add that. Love your neighbor. Love everybody. Even, those do, even though they have, you don't have. You may, don't, you may not have, but love them. Don't, don't be anxious. Don't be furious. Don't get vexed. Be happy. Relax. God has your back. May God bless you.